You're listening to Discography Discussion, episode 205, Entombed. Hosted by Dan Terry. Well, is it starting to get hot in here, guys? John Beatty. Let's see, this is where I start getting into it. And Joseph Wren. I see a future with a giant door and a wall that may or may not have a second door. <laughs> Presented by DiscussMetal.com. And if you revel in flesh because tomorrow is another night of the living dead... Then you are ready for this episode of Discography Discussion. I am Joe. That is Dan. That is John. What is up, all you fine folks out there in podcast land? We are back, actually, in the new year. I know, we've already released a couple episodes in the new year, but I'm coming at you from the past to deliver you this episode in the future. So wrap your mind around that. Dude, we listened to Entombed this week. So some old school disgusting yeah what do you what are you gonna call this let's scoop all the mids out of it and just be thrash and bark at the mic at least until the very end of the discography when we did this weird blues thing that we'll get to later but is still the end. very present the end. in my like mind. The second half. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, so this is going to blow people's mind, and it's not going to make sense until we're done with the discussion. But I would argue that the death metal entombed is like twenty percent of the discography. Like the, the the old school death metal styled entombed. There's more of the entombed that meatheads don't like than there is entombed that meatheads do like. I'm going to go on record and say that I like most of it. But there are times where it does start feeling like a chore. So we will absolutely get into that and not make this a chore of an episode for you to listen to. So we're going to start fast? I like Entombed regardless of what year I'm listening to it. You're just not expecting the weird when you've been listening to the death metal side of Entombed that just sounds like every old school cassette thrash metal band that I want to listen to every single day. It's not about beautiful vocals. It's about being heavy and playing fast and spinning your hair at the front of the stage. That's what we're here for. I would say that we get that throughout the uh, throughout the discography overall, really. Um, these guys definitely always keep it. Uh, well, they at least keep it metal in the sense of, uh, you know, at first it's like death metal that, you know, only me and 80 of your friends have ever listened to. And the other part of it's like biker uh, <laughs> hair, uh, hair, hair spinning. It's all very greasy. And um, you definitely start feeling getting some old school rock and roll vibes in there from time to time. Well, before Dan has a midlife crisis and buys himself a motorcycle, I'm going to take this time to say thank you to everyone for listening to the podcast. Thank you for listening and for subscribing. If you are not a subscriber, then you can find everything discography discussion at discussmetal.com. We're on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, twitch.tv forward slash discuss metal dan for all your live streaming and gaming needs so if you have an amazon echo or a google home you have no excuse ask it to play the latest episode of the discography discussion podcast and it will we're also on facebook and on twitter at discuss metal be sure to like favorite and subscribe it really helps us out it lets us know you're listening and now dan is going to tell us all about five star reviews if you are going to leave a five-star review on our podcast, please leave an actual message explaining why you want it to be five stars. Don't do a drive-by rating. Nobody likes a drive-by rating. A drive-by one star is devastating, but a drive-by five-star, I want to know why you like the show, because then I just want to do more of that. I just want to keep you know, pressing that button, you know, right there, right there, right there, right there, and I won't stop. We got a comment on episode 200 KMFDM with Matt Nas of Roach Coach. Celestial Bikini Atoll says, I love KMFDM. I truly enjoyed this review of their discography. You guys are so funny to listen to as well. My introduction to KMFDM started with Don't Blow Your Top, but my favorite albums from them are definitely Angst and Money with Nihil Naive tied for third place. I don't even remember those records. Uh I've per- I've purged Here's them the from deal. My they cash. sounded like KMFDM. Fair enough. Okay. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We did that about 21 times in a row. I definitely remember that. Over on Twitter, my boy Violence Obscene commented, KMFDM is by far my favorite band of all time, even in their ups and downs. Can't wait to listen to this. Uh, yeah. I mean, that episode, obviously a labor of love. 
one of those episodes where, you know, I went into the band hearing the singles, you know, here basically hearing, you know, if there was a greatest hits of KMFDM, I'd heard that. Um, and then it was interesting to listen to like 21 albums where it really was just just that the, the whole time. They, you could buy a greatest hits and be fine and not need anything extra. You could buy an album and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Yeah, you absolutely could just buy an album. But I mean, I don't know. I, I think uh, if this was a Patreon review, I'd be like, yeah, they're definitely a stream for me. Uh, not, not necessarily a buy. <laughs> so, Dan, tell us about Entombed. Well, Entombed is one of the Swedish big four of death metal. And um, even though I really don't feel like they are death metal necessarily, but uh, if you're looking for like, you know, the stuff that you can read online, they're a Swedish band. They've been active since 1987. Uh, They've broken up uh, one time, notably, and now they are back, but haven't actually done anything other than release their work or release one of their worst records uh, in a live setting. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, really, though, uh, I love Entomb's early records. Uh, they had a very interesting sound as far as uh, guitar tone. I'm actually going to, you know, attempt to navigate my way through gear talk here a little bit. Uh, and all I'm really going to say is that their guitars sound like they are chainsaws. They sound like, and they call them the buzzsaw guitar sound that was popularized by Entombed. And so, you know, you've got uh, you've got your Florida and death metal bands, your your muddy cannibal corpse and obituary, you know, type of bands where it's all crunch, 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 crunch. Whereas uh, Entombed absolutely crunches, plays very similar style of death metal, but they've got this this raw edge, this this grindy, noisy sound uh, that uh, is very interesting hearing it from Scandinavian bands, especially especially a band from Stockholm, Sweden, you, you know, you're going to expect something, you know, clean and, 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 and pretty and, and beautiful. And uh, that's just never been in tune. Uh, they are a uh, they are kind of of the old school mindset of we're going to be loud and noisy and keep it as rock and roll as possible. Now, I do think that they definitely keep it a little too rock and roll sometimes. But um, but overall, yeah, these guys are these guys are a band that you want to listen to if you're looking for historical context uh, as to why death metal was so big in Sweden. Uh, bands like Entombed and Dismember and Grave, like those bands, were playing death metal much like it much like it sounded in America, but with a little bit more finesse. And uh, you know, we'll get into it. You know, we talked about Living Sacrifice last week and kind of how they approached like solos and and stuff like that and. It's interesting hearing the Scandinavian bands play their solos, uh, to quote John, a little bit more tastefully. <laughs> so there, is, there is a nuance, and that nuance obviously would eventually end up growing into what we now know as the kind of Swedish death metal sound. I have a vision in my head of every thrash band that came out in the mid to late 80s, throughout the 90s, that for lack of a better explanation, just played as fast as possible, got at the front of the stage, played as loud as possible. If hair was there to be windmilled, it was indeed windmilled. And the vocals did not sound good. Metallica's the name that everybody knows, but Metallica stands out on their own. What Entombed is doing on these records, for the most part, is the dirty, dingy, club that is dark maybe has some colorful lights if the owner spent the money and everybody just gets destroyed in whatever crowd or pit you are able to have in that scenario it's not pretty it's not nice to listen to but it's enjoyable for me because this is the gearhead riffage that I wanted to play when I started playing guitar many years ago. Um, so the fun thing about this, <clears throat> uh, Entombed and, and last week's episode, Living Sacrifice, so a carrying over theme and probably will be for most of this year for me. Uh, never listened to this band. Um, you know, same with Living Sacrifice, same with a lot of the bands that we're going to be talking about this year. And honestly, you know, it depends on... I think there's nothing worse at times than music fans because they have we have the potential to ruin shit for you before you even listen to it. So if you're already not a fan of death metal, then when someone's like, you got to hear this death metal because it's the best of the death metal. And you're like, but I don't really like death metal. 
So, and especially when you start naming like Dan did earlier, some of those bands, I'm like, oh God, I don't really like those, what I've heard of those bands either. So I'm even less thrilled to listen to this shit. And then you hear the other side of the coin of Entombed or Living Sacrifice, at least with these two bands, which I couldn't think, as I had to listen to these two bands back to back, I was like, ugh, what, what different bands they are. But actually they share a lot of commonalities in the fact that they never really were kind of one thing. They were a lot of things and just a melting pot of styles and genres over the 20 some odd years they are around. But I think that's kind of the interesting thing about Entombed and with Living Sacrifice is I think there's kind of a little bit of something there for everybody. It's just a matter of are you willing to get past the parts that you don't like? Are you willing to take the medicine to get through the sugar? And I think as we kind of discussed this this discography specifically, I know Dan and I went back and forth where I was like, I'm just not really feeling this one. And he's like, I do like this one. I'm like, I like parts. And then I'm like, I like these two records. And he goes, oh, I don't like those ones. I like this one. I'm like, oh, fuck, that one's terrible. So I think basically to be said, I think this is actually going to be a really enjoyable, uh, enjoyable experience for the listeners because... I don't think we're going to agree on everything. And I think maybe potentially, you know, I know what Dan said, Joe, I don't know, you know, any of your thoughts or opinions on any of these records yet, but I think hopefully when we're done, I think everyone might have an appreciation for the era or the records that they didn't think they liked initially. John was so quiet at the start of this episode. I was expecting Dan levels of explosive. What the fuck is wrong with all of you? This is the worst shit I've ever heard in my life. I think that's something I'm going to try to do with the podcast. And I've actually been, you know, since I'll be joining this now and you'll hear my voice more consistently. And, you know, something I told Dan, you know, I just I don't want to be like this sucks because I don't like it because I don't think that's necessarily accurate. Like, you know, there are plenty of bands and plenty of songs and all that in music history where it's like I may not like something, but I can look at some of the music and go, I could see why people would like this. Or I can find something in it that I like, but I don't want to listen to it ad nauseum ever. Like, you know, if, if when we start on the first record, which Joe will probably go, let's start off with blah, blah, blah's left hand path, whatever year that came out. 1990. Thanks for that transition, John. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm going to go ahead and just go first just because I don't have a whole lot to say, not being an avid death metal fan. And, and we'll, you know, clear the carpeted way for Dan to, to you know. Uh, release all of his uh, wisdom on all this shit that I don't know. Dan gets a oh, carpet now. So pent up, man. I know. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna I'm gonna foreplay our way into it, so you can just fucking gush and release all over everyone. With, uh... oh! <laughs> um, so this record as a whole sort of is. It was better than I was expecting it to be, but it is why I don't necessarily like this era of you know death metal. It. Production is a little bit lacking for me. I like good sounding stuff. I'm sorry. It's also why I don't like punk music. Um, but, you know, one of the bigger takeaways for me was I can hear the influence on bands I do really like. Like, I can hear where Hatebreed sound came from in some of this riffing. And the thing that I also kind of took away was someone will correct me, I'm sure. Um, but I just don't really think bands were had this sound like it sounds different downtuned and modern in a way not from a production standpoint but really from the playing perspective that i feel was just so far ahead of its time and you know i was able to take that away and just kind of be like wow i can understand why a bit like jost is really big on you know entombed as a, as one of the main songwriters and so forth and a lot of the other bands that came from the hardcore scene and it's very interesting that a death metal band informed more or less current hardcore and you know i thought that was an interesting thing to look at from a perspective now all these years later but you know i I couldn't help but laugh you know the last track those vocals i mean (laughs) i just was like i know this is probably meant to be scary or whatever and you know maybe back then it was because you haven't heard things like that but that's that's the kind of shit about death metal and especially in this era where i'm like this is so laughable it's like b-movie laughable like how can it be taken seriously and I'm sure to some that's the that's the fun of it, like a B movie. Like if you love B horror movies, that's the fun. You're in on the joke. I just don't know if this was a joke then, like it has sort of become. I think this was far more receivable because of the cosmetic similarities with older thrash bands, even down to the production. And yes, there are things here that you've never heard before, but black metal was already a thing, right? So compared to that, this sounds like 
the greatest orchestration in the history of whatever Mozart had in his head and Schubert played on a piano. I think the left hand path is an incredible record. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and the reason I think it's incredible is number one, because of the buzzsaw guitar sound. That's number one. Uh, number two would have to be I love the I love the vocal delivery, how the vocals almost sound kind of belched. It's like a it's like a, it's like a transition between hardcore shouting and trying to get that growl in there. And really, it's at the time everybody was really people weren't trying to sound like Chris Barnes back then. Uh, they were everybody was trying to sound like Chuck Schuldner, who did a very similar um, hardcore bark uh, metal yell. And over time, those vocals progressively got deeper and deeper and more extreme. But I like it um, because. It also has a little bit of that punk energy. Um, they're rhythmically they they resemble a punk or hardcore band more than what you would be getting out of uh, out of a band out of Florida at the time. Uh, and I think that's what's interesting too is that the lead guitar work is excellent when it really has no business being. You know, it really they could have just played anything over it and it would have sounded all right. It would have sounded metal. Uh, for reference, see living sacrifice is non-existent, you know, um, where it's just like, oh, okay, well, this is the part where the solo goes. So we're just going to do something. Uh, the, these, these sound much more like uh, composed solos, uh, more in the style of like carcass where that dude's going to deliver that same solo every single time he plays that song live. Um, and I really like it. I like, I like that it's upbeat. I like that. It's not full blast. It's not grind, you know? Um, it's just some nice, chunky, in-your-face death metal. Um, and it doesn't have to be more than that. Yeah, it's cheesy. I mean, you've got like the ho the actual Halloween theme music playing uh, at the end of a song. Um, you know, at least as maybe it's a copyright safe version, but it sounds identical to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, lyrics about death and gore, morbid devourment, talking about being deceased, rotting, everything, all the good stuff, all the stuff that you want out of a 1990s death metal record. And Left Hand Path is still one of my favorites just because it's a record that's not trying to be anything other than what it is. Um, you know, I don't think necessarily that they're trying to be scary uh, with the, with those vocals on The Truth Beyond. I mean, yeah, it's a little, it's a little jacked. It's a little weird. Um, I've, I've heard weirder again, see last week's episode, but I, I think that, I think that it was at the time it was, dude, we're really, really, really into these death metal bands that we're influenced by. And so we're going to make our own version of what we think that is. And, uh, and in that regard, left hand path succeeds. It's not a long investment. It's not, a, it's not an insanely, you know, it's not some 72 minute rock and roll death and roll album which they're going to do to me at one point <laughs> although the record that i'm complaining about it's only 50 minutes but my god does it feel like it's four days um but yeah left hand path i mean 10 out of 10 i mean would buy again like i uh, love this record i've got it on full dynamic range vinyl uh that and clandestine uh so you know it's it's an a for me i mean it's it's the entombed record that i go to when i want to listen to entombed so Take from that what you will. So this is another example where the first record is the record that defines the band. And if you're going to listen to Entombed, it's going to be this. No, that was just more my personal opinion uh, of the record. This is the era of Entombed that I like the most uh, because I'm a much bigger fan of death metal than I am of death and roll, whatever the hell that means. And I would say this doesn't represent Entombed overall. But I do think in the general sense or the scene of death metal, if that exists now in 2021, um, to death metal heads, everybody remembers Entombed for Left Hand Path and Clandestine um, and maybe even Wolverine Blues. But uh, I would say anybody that goes directly to these two albums as their, uh, as their Entombed fix, those guys, they just don't like the way the, the latter half of the discography sounds. So the, to answer your question, it's yes and no. Guys like me are going to say, yeah, in Tomb, they only put out two albums. Uh, and then there's going to be then there's going to be guys that guys like John that are going to be like, yeah, but like I don't really care that much for like the death metal stuff. But some of the stuff they started doing later on was different and more interesting. Are we ready for clandestine? Oh, I suppose. 1991. Well, Clandestine is, is one of those records that aesthetically seems very similar to the previous record. It definitely uh, it's does. Got a, it's got a lot of similarities. 
Um, it's actually a little bit more punk to my ears. Uh, it's not almost not as serious. It's a little bit more show offy with the solos and, and stuff like that. Um, the production quality is actually stepped up from Left Hand Path uh, considerably. And um, but I noticed that they go for a little bit more traditional song structures. Uh, it's also very noticeable that there's a different vocalist on this record. Uh, and I do not care for these vocals at all. Um, I think they're dumb. It almost sounds like a guy making fun of death metal more than it sounds like actual death metal vocals. Because uh, every now and again, it's just out of nowhere. You're just like, you know, I'm sitting here trying to listen to this record. It's death metal, right? So it's cheesy enough. But then he's got to just go, <laughs> like, you're, dude, like, what really, you, what, dude? Honestly, what is up with all the laughing on the first two records? I, I don't know. There's really not a whole lot of it on Left Hand Path. Okay, maybe I just feel like there's so much more because of how much is on this record. <laughs> it's the cosmic similarities between the two albums from an instrumental standpoint. And maybe I'm spoiled because Left Hand Path has had a remaster or re-release. The guitars sound identical on these first two albums. Well, it's a buzzsaw guitar. That's what they were famous for. They had to carry it over to the next record. But the first thing I hear is the drastically different vocals. And it sounds like the band needed someone to fill the void of lead vocalist. And the guy that they had wanted to do a Slayer thing so bad that he just couldn't pull it off. Well, it was their drummer. They just they just had the drummer do the vocals because <laughs> um, they had fired their lead singer uh, for some reason. It's not that it doesn't seem to be publicized anywhere, uh, but uh, because he ended up being obviously the original singer ended up becoming the the, the singer of the band again. Uh, All right, guys, yeah, this is- I want to be the death metal Phil Collins. Can I do that? Sure, dude. Go right ahead. It'll be fine. Right? Well, maybe that was what it was. Maybe he was trying to lay down drum tracks while he was doing the vocals. I'm not sure. Uh, they're not terrible. They're definitely not the worst death metal vocals I've ever heard. But uh, because death metal vocals, like, honestly, like, let's be real. They don't have to be good. Like, not, like, objectively, they, they don't have to really do much. They just, they're like, uh, it's like John uh, John Carmack said about a porn movie one time where he's like, you know, a story in a porn movie is, uh, you know, it's expected to be there, but nobody ever, ac- nobody actually has to engage in it, you know? <laughs> like, um, and so it's, it's the vocals are fine, but I think that, like, the cheese that existed on Left Hand Path gets a little bit too much, it becomes a little too intense on this record because now you've got a guy doing a Cookie Monster voice actually laughing at you and adding these weird vocal effects to his voice and stuff. Um, to a record that I think if they had had their original singer probably would have been better. It also probably would have been the exact same record with just better vocals. Um, and I'm well, fine with that. But then I would have just said, oh, yeah, Left Hand Path and Clandestine, they're the same record. Well, it's funny you say that because, like, to me, like, straight out the gate, you already said it. I'm not a fan of this new vocalist. The production for the rest of the band, though, I, I think is really good. It's it's obviously a step up from what they were doing. Um, you know, for as much as I kind of shit on you know, left hand path were just, you know, basic death metal tropes that I'm just not a fan of. I think 90% of this record as a whole, I do like, it's just that the vocals honestly ruin it for me. Like everything good that the band and the music is setting up is just ruined by these shitty vocals. Um, to me, like one of the first tracks I got, like where I was like, holy shit, more of this please was sinners bleed. I was like, yo, fucking badass track. Um, yeah. And you know, just, (sighs) Sometimes when bands go through this, uh, you know, lineup changes, especially a vocalist, you know, I can't help but wonder, like, was there nobody else that could? I mean, I know you said it was the drummer. So, I mean, obviously, the dude's just already there. He knows what he's doing. Obviously, nobody would like they book studio time and they're like, well, we got to put vocals on this. But it's like, like, all I can think (laughs) of as I'm listening to this record and this dude's like horrible vocals, I'm like, how is he able to pull the other shit off? Because, like, I just don't see him being able to even do that. So, like, it just, it would bum me the fuck out if I was a fan of the band from the first record, heard this, and then was like, if you were in an area where you could have seen them live, I probably would have been like, nah, I'm good. Like, I just don't think this dude can pull off the old shit either. So, like, no, I don't, yeah, just, I'd rather it be an instrumental band at that point almost. But I did really love the incorporation of the keys, you know? I mean, that's a little bit more melody than they had on the previous record and kind of is... Because this came out in, what, 92? They were pretty good about putting a record out every, like, two years, it seemed. Two to three. Whatever. Um, yeah, this one's officially 91, but okay. what does that mean in 2020? Sure. But I was just going to say, <laughs> it, it's just one of those, and, you know, I, I 
you know, the same thing kind of could be said about Living Sacrifice because the each of these bands did a really good job of incorporating just a little something. And w- <laughs> while both kind of would just out of left field some shit sometimes uh, moving forward, it is interesting that they never just rested on like, well, fuck it, here's what we do and this is all we do and that's all we're doing moving forward. You kind of have to love a band that even two records in at this point is still incorporating some other stuff. And I don't really know how many other bands were doing this back then. I mean, that's that's kind of the fun thing of thinking about and doing some of these discographies and, and listening to you guys talk about some of these discographies from foreign bands is this was before the Internet. So it's not like music was necessarily as accessible as it became to be informed by other bands. So really, your influences are probably going to be a lot more localized. So. I don't know if a lot of other death metal bands were incorporating keys and melodies quite like this um, at this same time. I definitely wasn't really necessarily hearing it when thinking back to some of the bands of this style here in in uh, here in the States. So I don't know. It's just it's kind of the fun thing of going into this as a first time listen for me and trying to retroactively think about what was kind of coming out and maybe who was influencing who in a time where it wasn't easy to connect with bands like that. Well, I'm going to attempt to I'm going to attempt to give you a little bit of context on that. So, yeah, they were obviously um, before the internet, but tape trading was huge uh, at the time. Bands bands would bands would write to other bands and um, But didn't you say they would trade the tape- they would trade demos? Didn't you say at one point with some of the tapes you gotten the the I think they were European bootlegs basically? Yeah, like the Polish bootlegs. Yeah, Polish. Okay, yeah. I was gonna say, didn't you say that some of that shit wasn't almost like we joked with like Kazan stuff like that? Like you would get something and it definitely was not what it said it was. Oh, I don't know. I, I can't verify that. Okay. Uh, but I can. I mean, I can't verify it for everybody ever to who has ever gotten a tape. <laughs> but uh, I can say that yes, they, they also they, they drew obviously internationally um, from from American death metal. Uh, because those bands were popular. Roadrunner had distribution worldwide. So, like, odds are the first death metal these guys heard in record stores was was coming from the States, right? Uh, but then you look at a town, you know, you say bands in their local scene. This is Stockholm, Sweden. Um, so, like, every band that you can think of, you know, nowadays came from Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, and I think some of the stuff you're talking about incorporating keys and melody and stuff, I think that was more or less kind of their mark like for their scene, right? Um, was adding a little bit of finesse, a little bit of melody, and then you know, years later, you end up with the Gothenburg type type sounding bands um, that were also drew he- very heavily uh, from even these older bands, um, because some of these older bands, even though they were still more in the style of the American death metal bands, uh, they did add a little bit of finesse and a little bit of tastefulness to what they were doing. And um, they were more willing to experiment with different sounds, as we're going to hear here in a little bit. But, like, I do think that, like, they absolutely just had a very, very wide array of influences. And uh, as we're going to even see further on, their influences are not limited to death metal or, or even thrash or any of that stuff anyway. Um, the influence that American music had on these Swedish bands back in the 90s is undeniable. 1993 Wolverine Blues. So what's interesting to me, and, you know, I blame a lot of this on, you know, Josta's podcast. (laughs) Hearing him and so many other people talk about this record and just the legacy of it. I honestly was expecting it to be more of the same because, you know, whenever he talks about Entombed, especially this record, you always hear him say like bolt thrower and shit like that. So. I was totally expecting something in that room when I got to this record. No. (laughs) So imagine, imagine as I throw on this record and I'm just like, uh, and you know, like my first note that I wrote was I go, okay, so you're a band of this, you're a fan of this band on the first two records. Like when you buy this, are you like immediately like, what the fuck? Or what is this? (laughs) <laughs> would not buy again <laughs> every no. fan of every band has that moment when they buy the new album and it just doesn't sound like what they are expecting that you try to justify it you try to see it for what it is and above all else you try to look past it my well, favorite well, example for me was the first time i bought the fourth Godsmack record. 
because it doesn't sound anything like the previous records. And I spent a very long time for at least 24 hours trying to justify why you would release something that just didn't sound good. Well, the thing that, like... Well, I mean, you should have bought Wolverine Blues. (laughs) (laughs) I think the thing to me about this record, as a singular album, it is not a bad record. But the problem is, is I... And this is a, a, a problem a lot of bands I feel like make. I'm fine with you growing your sound, and I'm fine with you experimenting with stuff. But the problem is sometimes I feel like bands are so sometimes so quick to just be doing whatever they're doing and they're all about, but they don't really leave any breadcrumbs to kind of help you as the listener get there, whatever the transitional gap was of how they arrived to the sound. Like, it would almost be one of those things, and I even had to do a little bit of digging because I, I wanted Dan to kind of inform me more and me to actually learn things in real time on this podcast about about these things and questions I have. But it was almost one of those where I was like, okay, so did, like, the vocalist... Like, did everyone fucking mass exit this band? And then the vocalist from the last one was the only one left. And he's like, all right, continuing on with Entombed. Like, is it like a haste the day kind of scenario where you're like, one dude remained and kept moving forward and kind of changed the sound. And one it doesn't man seem, who doesn't had a vision, to, but got kicked out of the band. <laughs> it's, yeah, uh, all the it's almost like the exact opposite of uh, the fucking days of the new band where they got kicked out of every band they were in other than their singer. But anyway, like, again, this isn't a bad album for what it is, but it is a thing where I just don't understand how if, and Dan, I guess, is prototype of this person. I don't understand how you could have been a fan of Entombed as a death metal band. And then they put out this and then you're kind of like, yeah, I'm cool with this with no warning at all. Like, I just don't see, I don't see that. And I also am not entirely sure. Like I said, the microcosm of people I've heard talk about this, love this record, but I don't know if they love the old stuff too. Like if that's a very, very minute group or if it's like, you either like the, the first two records and then that's it. And, and entombed as the band is dead. And then basically if you like this, then this is where you start and you don't fucking listen to the other two. Like, I just don't know what the crossover is for the band from these first three records. I'm going to make a prediction. Dan, does this record have enough of the thrash sound or does it cosmetically remind you of very early metalcore with the riffs? Sounds like COC. So so here's here's what I'm going to say about Wolverine Blues. Uh, To answer your question, John, how do you go from the first two records to, to this and being like, this is fine. You are what the dog really, in that fire. What it really boils on, what it really, yeah, what it really boils, <laughs> sorry, what it really boils down to is Wolverine Blues. I did not really care for very much when I first got it, hmm. but if you look in, uh, if you look, if you look at the year it came out and the year that I bought it, I didn't buy it the year it came out. I bought it several years later, uh, but even then, at a time it was before I had access to music on streaming services. Can I ask I mean, you a real I quick could, question though? How into Entombed, like, were you into the first two when they came yes. out? Yes. Okay. Not not when they came out. Not in 1999. I mean, not not in 1990. I was like four. Um, okay. I'm, I'm more of a newer breed of, of, of metal fan, whereas these bands from the 90s, all of these bands started off with me just reading about them online. Okay. I just, for I context. Even, I used to even read on Amazon, like, reviews. Like, right. That's as much as I could do is, like, read Amazon reviews. And people would, people would make lists on Amazon back in the day of, like, what are the best death metal albums from Sweden or whatever? And then so you'd buy that album, you know, and um, sometimes you had to import it. I had to import Left Hand Path okay. uh, the first time I I, I got it. But um, no, so yeah, I was really into those records. Okay. I, I liked them, thought they were great. Um, and so for Wolverine Blues, I didn't like how much, like, obviously like Pantera happened. It was kind of one of the biggest things about this record. Um, so much more groove. Uh, but at the same time, and this is something I don't really like talking about because it like ruins my ruins my credibility as a death metal fan or whatever. But like the thing that I dislike the most about death metal is the lack of memorability. Like you're here gonna hear a good riff here and there that's gonna really stick with you, but by and large, death metal bands, the attraction is the extremity and 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 the speed, the the pace, the 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 intensity of the vocals, uh the dr- the the technical drumming. Um, all of these factors are great, but they're not necessarily memorable uh, unless you've listened to a record a bazillion times, right? Uh, Wolverine Blues, on the other hand, became memorable because it's like if I ordered Wolverine Blues on Amazon and I wait five days to get it in the mail and I listen to it the first time and my first impression 
um, isn't a positive one immediately. I'm still going to continue listening to that record because people didn't use music fans didn't used to be as fickle uh, back then as we are now. Now we hear 30 seconds of a song and we're like, ah, eh, trash, move on. You know, and like for all we know, the the other two minutes and thirty seconds of that song were incredible. But because the first few seconds didn't grab us, uh, we don't listen to it. Uh, whereas if you paid actual money before you had a full time job, before you had disposable income, like like I mowed some dude's grass to get this record. You know what I mean? Like so, it's it's one of those like I'm gonna listen to it. I'm gonna keep listening to it. And as I kept listening to it, the more I kept remembering the songs, the more I started like. Um, the song Contempt is one of my favorite ones. Full of Hell is awesome. Like, I love this record because I remember it. Wolverine Blues is one of the only Entombed records that I can, like, pull up a riff from memory. Um, and it's also not less extreme. So that's one of the things that is important here. It's not death metal. It is firmly in groove metal territory here. Uh, but because they got the original vocalist back, that's noticeable. Vocals are far su su far superior on Wolverine Blues. Vocals are far uh, superior. Vocals are far superior on Wolverine Blues. And really, the overall sound is far more commercial than it was before, but it's still very, very heavy in the commercial sense. So you've still got a little bit of death metal on some of these. It's almost trans it's like they're transitioning out of death metal into what they eventually were going to become. And uh, so there's still enough of the old in here for me to be like, okay, it's still a heavy record with a guy that only screams. It's not like there's a bunch of pop courses and 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 weird influences from like radio rock in it. So yeah, I mean Wolverine Blues is one of those like, well, this is the record that I'm going to spend the next two weeks with. So it grew on me. And now I think of it as a classic. Like I think of Wolverine Blues and I'm like, yeah, dude, like they did it. Not to not to keep bringing up living sacrifice comparisons, but this is like their reborn. You know, this is where this is where they literally become something else. <laughs> so, you know, eight out of ten would buy again. Are we ready for nineteen ninety seven? That is a very large Roman numeral. Excuse me, gentlemen. Nineteen ninety seven. Six 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 to ride, shoot straight, and speak the truth. Wow, all of those things. Now we're going to get into it a little bit. So it's time for the dirge. John asks for context, like, how is Wolverine Blues fine if you're a huge fan of Left Hand Path and Clandestine? It's fine because it sounds like Entombed, but it's Entombed just doing a kind of a different thing. This is the kind of stuff where it starts to become not okay <laughs> for a uh, for a death metal fan. See, this is where I start getting into it. Yeah. Hey, Dan, do you remember that time you bought the new Mortification record and it didn't sound like Mortification? That's uh, what happened to me this week because despite the slight changes on the last album, the band essentially sounded the same. This is the first time I had to ask myself, did these guys wake up one day and listen to White Zombie and say, guys... I got it. We're going to do this groove thing, and the vocals are going to have more of a baritone, down-facing view, but we're still going to do that guitar sound that everybody knows us for, right? Because we're entombed, and everything has to sound kind of like that. I don't hate this album. It's just not what I'm expecting after listening to three albums of figuratively the same thing. Um, well, I mean... I I don't necessarily agree with all of that, but John, I did think, you enjoy your fake Rob Zombie this week? I, I mean, I don't necessarily hear fake Rob Zombie. I think the thing for me, honestly, you know, now that we're out of the death metal realm with this band, and this band kind of is becoming what it will become moving forward, I kind of enjoy it. Uh, it's a little more loose and and more fun style of rock and roll that I kind of like. You know, at times it kind of touches on that stoner garage rock kind of vibe and, and less of the death metal stuff that I'm not necessarily a fan of. But to me, I kind of get a little bit more and Dan kind of pointed to this actually earlier, you know, kind of leaning a little bit more toward kind of punk and hardcore. I kind of hear like a little bit of Misfits and Danzig style influences on this stuff, as well as, you know, the band wasn't super big, but they were still around uh, kind of doing this. They call it goth and roll, but I mean, it's more or less kind of the same thing, but like 69 Eyes. Um, are also kind of a band that I hear and you know I'm kind of, on this record especially I hear you know an influence on how they could be 
really integral to like a band like Viking Skull moving forward, like how they're kind of combining just really percussive, big sounding riffs. Like, I think that was the thing that was really interesting about this is I still think the band's strengths up until this point more lie in the mid tempo songs as they allow those giant fucking cascading riffs to just pummel everyone. And I think that's if you're again not in Dan's boat being a death metal fan, but if you're into that kind of stoom, stoner doom genre, that's what you're coming here for. Those big giant loud ass riffs. And I think at this point, you know, because I'm I'm the notes I wrote were definitely and I'm, what I'm trying to give you is more of how I felt in the moment of listening to these records to give you an accurate representation of my actual feelings, not how I feel after listening to everything and knowing where everything goes. But I'm definitely more on board with this record as the first one where I'm like, yo, if someone showed me this, I probably would have been an Entomb fan from this point moving forward uh, in real time. As I there's some of the stuff I liked on the first two records, but this was the first one I really heard all the way through where I was like, yep, I really enjoy all this. I can understand why people like this band and hold them in a high regard personally. Yeah, for me, it was not a good turn um, just because like, especially at the time, uh, when I was really getting into Entombed, you know, um, I didn't buy this all that much late after Wolverine Blues, you know. So and that's so, sorry to cut you off. That was actually what I was trying to figure out is like, you know, with some of these bands and some of the discographies you've talked about, you know, you're you're almost like we are doing right now. When you found the band, you're just blasting through the discography all at once. So you don't have that time to kind of grow or the right. reverse progression. So that's what I was actually when I had asked how far into the band's discography or career were you when you started? So it sounds like kind of now-ish moving back is when you found them? Yeah. Well, okay. no, no, no. So, like, I found them... When I first got into Entombed, I want to say um, was probably, like, in 2001. So, like, Morningstar would have been the first. Oh, okay. Okay, wow. Would have, I been, thought, would, okay. would have been the new Entombed record that year. So, I thought you were um, on way before start, that. But I wanted to start at the beginning, so... Uh, as I, out, I often do. Um, Sorry, I derailed you. I just, gonna, that was I'm why I wanted be, to know that. No, I, well, I'm just going to be straight up. I don't really appreciate rock and roll that much as a genre. <laughs> there, I said it. You're wrong, you did, but you know? it's okay. I forgive you. I just no. said I don't appreciate it. I'm not saying it's bad. It's just not for me. Um, I don't love it. I understand why people love it. It's It's fun. And unfortunately, I just don't enjoy fun music taking this record as it stands as its own thing and removing my personal feelings from it it's got good riffs it's got a, it's got a good flow to it um and it actually is significantly heavier than what you'd get out of like a rock and roll band so you still got that metal element there um there's still a little buzz saw-y on the guitars which is nice um i appreciate all that uh but i don't like the dude's vocals i don't like how it sounds like a dude screaming at a biker bar uh, <laughs> but at the same time at the same time, though, that's also why people that like that kind of music would listen to it, you know? Uh, so, I mean, the solos are a lot more bluesy. They're a lot more, you know, in your face. I mean, you can almost smell whiskey listening to this record. And, yeah, you um, can. <laughs> it's interesting. It's very interesting to see how much of an American influence it really does have. It is weird. I think you that's know? something you and I talked about quite a bit was mm -hmm. how interesting the time, because, like I said, this came out in 97 how american this felt yeah like i said uh, i don't love it but uh i could see what people do so i don't think it's bad but it's definitely if you're a fan of if you're a fan of entombed from uh from left hand path all the way up to wolverine blues then you're really not gonna love this record do you unless unless you're just a more dynamic person than i am do you with that being the case of you not liking music like this typically do does a band like Entombed, who you do like for what they, the itch they do provide for you, the, do you listen to this more and try to get into it after the fact of already making the decision, like, I'm just not into this? Like, do you try to go back even before us doing this? Like, where you're like, you know what, I'm going to give this one more time. Maybe there's something about this because I like this band or I love this band that will, it will grow on me eventually, like Wolverine Blues has for you. Not really. Um, just being straight up, I just didn't enjoy it. And Okay. Um, and at that point, I had enough other records <laughs> by other bands that I could just listen to that instead. Fair enough. Um, when I was kind of curate, curating what my tastes were going to be. Um, but I haven't revisited this record probably since I got it and listened to it for a couple of weeks and then just decided it wasn't for me. 
Um, and then it not not since it's probably been like 15 years since I listened to this oh, wow. record. Um, and I listened to it just for the show, and I was like, "Yep, still not really into it very much." Which is interesting because I don't have that experience often. Oftentimes, I'll go back to a record I haven't visited in over a decade and be like, "Oh, I don't even know why I didn't like this. This is awesome." Well, see, that's you know? what I thought maybe would happen with this discography or parts of this discography akin to the Limp Bizkit episode. So I didn't know if maybe that sort of same thing has happened for you with this no, band. No, not not really. Not with Entombed. Okay. Fair enough. 1998. Same difference. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, that's, that's about how it felt. The same difference. It just, this record fucking dragged, at least for me. I don't know if anyone else. It it's less did. than an hour. But holy shit, like, does it feel like this record was like an hour and a half and just took forever to get where it was going? Like, it Jesus drags. Christ. It drags. And it's not it's not their strongest effort, but I actually really, like, if I had to pick between this and the last album, I would pick this one. Um, just because this actually has more of, like, an alternative rock, like a more modern rock influence to it. Um, it almost sounds like Foo Fighters in places. Like I, the dude screams just like Dave Grohl. Wow, dude! At times, really? I kept getting. Uh, I thought it was interesting, you know, like trying to, trying to find a positive for this. I did really like Supreme Good, you know, that Tom Morello style riff, that was like something different the band hadn't done, and and kind of like I'm saying, like, you know, sort of the same with Living Sacrifice. Again, like you know, we're doing these two episode spoilers uh, back to back, so that's why we're kind of talking about them both, but. It's it's really weird how those two bands were able to kind of slowly start incorporating things that were somewhat relevant to the time frame. Like Dan mentioned earlier, like, well, here's the Pantera influence coming through and so forth. And it was kind of funny as I'm listening to this record. I was like, all right, 98. Yeah, we're definitely in the like the meat and potatoes of fucking Rage Against the Machine at that point, you know, being a huge band and what Tom Morello had done with guitar playing. So to kind of hear that riff, I was like, this is kind of cool, but it's really for as much as Dan said, you know, Wolverine Blues, you know, had one of the few albums in their band's discography that was memorable. That was the only memorable part, really, for me on this whole record is that riff. Other than that, it just like I said, it just fucking went on way too long. And I just oh, that's all it is. It's (laughs) same difference. (laughs) And maybe we're looking into it much further than is necessary. I think this is simply what the band had been listening to that week, and this is what the next record is going to sound like. This is also the mid-90s, and the internet was starting to become more of a thing. So it's reasonable, I think, that the band was doing the classic mainstream record thing where the band themselves sits down and says, this is what the next album is going to sound like. And then they just don't talk about it. Now, why did they decide in 1998 to make it sound like fake Foo Fighters? I don't know. But if you listen to it for what it is, it's not the worst album by any means. It's just not what you want to listen to when you're listening to Entombed. There's not enough of the buzzsaw here to make it worth it. So it's more of an out-of-context shock, at least listening to all of these records in one week. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an alternative rock album by a band that used to be death metal. I do find things about it that I enjoy, but overall, it's it's too long. It tries to do a thing that the band is not really skilled at doing, uh, and so it just kind of falls flat on its face. Like, that's it. It's just, I don't think anybody in Entombed would say that it was their finest moment. So it's not a misunderstood classic. It's just a band that, that got... Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a band... Well, no, I mean, it really is. It's a band that uh, progressively got more popular because they were playing to more mainstream audience. Um, and they were like, okay, well, now that we're at the apex of our popularity, let's go ahead and put out something that's even more commercial and then hopefully break into mainstream popularity. Um, and this is just not the record to do that. Do you feel um, like they took a risk with this one? I'm not even going to dignify that with a response. <laughs> so, um, But yeah, I mean, it's, it starts getting better, though. Hell yeah. 2000 Uprising. So for this record, they were like, okay, so same difference obviously was not a good fit for us, but people seem to really like to ride, shoot straight and speak the truth. So let's do something. Let's go back to being that band, you know, again. Um, So, you know, John sitting here like, yeah, dude, aces across the board. Let's do it. I already got my drink ready. Let's, you know, let's make it happen. Uh, Whereas guys like me are all like, oh, you guys are going back to your, oh, you're going back to those roots. Oh, Okay. All right, well, I, let's see what you got, I guess. Yeah, this one, I mean, for as much as I, 
I think all of us kind of will agree that there it was a slag uh, for the last record. This one just right off the gates has more of a vibe to it. You know, seeing red, uh, say it in slugs. I mean, those those songs and this whole album really just feel like a band who's had a couple of beers are sitting in a room and they're just fucking jamming and having a great fucking time. And these songs just have such a better pace than the last one. Thank God they have a much better pace. Um, something, you know, I didn't really focus too much on the lyrics necessarily of this band, but I loved the line in Returning to Madness. I promote a lifestyle I can't really live. I fucking laugh so hard at that because if there were more vocalists or more band people who were probably being honest, that is a lyric that a lot of them probably like. I mean, we've all heard the story. Andrew WK doesn't party. Um, right. That's I mean, I have stories that I've heard from people that that's a lie, but it's just it's a funny, clever line. And I don't think, you know, the old tomb definitely would have been able to pull that line off. Um, overall, I think this is definitely my favorite of the discography so far. It just feels like a band in this iteration, at least, that feels comfortable doing what they do and just delivering a great fucking album from start to finish. I mean, in the flesh with those haunting keys in the intro and outro and that fucking awesome double bass riff part after the solo. I mean, as the song's kind of winding down, like what's not to love about this fucking record? Honestly, it's it's fucking action packed from start to finish. Hey, Dan, who is your favorite Southern rock hardcore band? Um, He is legend, even though they're not really that. So if the vocals on this album sounded a little bit different, would this check the same boxes for you? Oh, well, I mean, I haven't even said anything about about that yet, about this record yet. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, Uprising, Uprising is a step in the right direction, but it's still not really what I'm looking for out of Intune, but still a little bit too rock and roll. I think it's punchy, it's heavy, it's punky, gives me Danzig vibes sometimes. Like, it's fine. Uh, I don't have a problem with it, but uh, I also don't listen to it because I'm here for the metal and there just they, there just isn't that right now. We're, we're, we're going through a drought, a drought of metal. So if I had found Entombed on this album, it would have been just what the doctor ordered in 2000. It has riffs, it has a fucking groove, this is what guitar players want to do when they get together with the rest of the band and try to write new songs. It's not the most complicated thing you will ever hear, and it's got the right amount of energy that even though some of the songs run together with their ideas, it still all works together. The only thing that stops this kind of album from being made is a lead vocalist with a vision, so I'm surprised that the guy in charge went in this direction. I don't know what their influences were that year. I can't tie this one to another band. Other than we're popular, we are entombed, this is our sixth album, let's do something radio-friendly. Well, I mean, I think this is much less radio-friendly than, uh, than Same Difference. You know, like, much less radio-friendly. Um, this is more... This sounds more to me like they were just trying to have fun, and they did that, and mission accomplished. It's still not metal. I don't love it, but it is what it is. Are we ready for Morning Star? Yeah. 2001. Yes. Speaking of moving into the right direction. Solid um, record. Yeah, and the band is starting to get heavier again. Yeah. You're starting to get a little bit of that like death metal style tremolo picking in some of the songs. Um, the riffs are harder. The buzzsaw is kind of starting to get, you know, they put some like rust off on it and uh, and, and fired that fired that puppy up for a few songs. And um, vocals are much more screamy, loudy. It's funny about their vocals. They, they've never they've never sang. They've never had clean vocals at all. But uh, it was interesting how they were able to kind of kind of transition into that like biker like yell type of vocal. Um, but this record sounds like, you know, if you just put it on, a, if you just gave it a couple of steroids, uh, it would be something closer to Wolverine blues, you know? Um, and I think that's what they were going for here. I think they thought maybe we could ease the, we, we want to go back to being heavy again, because let's be honest, um, people like the heavier entombed. Uh, so let's keep doing what we want to do, but just throw in some of that heaviness that people are going to expect. Yeah, this is definitely a record for me that while not quite matching the overall sound and vibe of Uprising, just right out the gates again, giant fucking mountainous riffs, um, those driving double kick drums. 
you know, that's to me now, this is the Entomb that I'm fully on board for. Uh, I don't think I've said this yet, um, but honestly, major props to their rhythm section uh, throughout this whole career. I mean, they've just had phenomenal players in the band. And I think that's something maybe we haven't talked about throughout is just how great of a band this actually is. Um, but I do feel like sort of like Dan was saying to begin, I do feel like this is as close as we're ever going to get to the old sound at this point with some of the keys kind of being added back in to bring back some of that kind of gothic death metal vibes from before. Um I don't know if anyone noticed uh, in the opening track. Did you guys notice the, some of the Devil's Advocate uh, tie-ins? Yeah. Okay. I thought that was really cool. Pretty much for, all the lyrics. Pretty much all the lyrics of that song are quotes from Devil's yeah. Advocate. Yeah. And the thing that yeah. was kind of interesting to me is for uh, you know for as much Devil Satan worship shit as usually death metal bands go into, I don't think I've really ever encountered a band that's used uh, Devil's Advocate as a, a source. So that was kind of yeah. cool. Um, also in Ensemble of the Restless, that weird slow down sped up thing. That was a fucking cool production trick. I really enjoyed that. But um, for me, just overall, this is a great follow up and a nice one two punch after the slog that was same difference for me personally. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I can't complain about it too much. I, <laughs> I mean, you I could, could if I had you could. I could if I had more time. But I oh, mean, what else, is there, what, what else is there to say beyond like I just didn't dig it because I'm still more into heavy music and this this band kind of stopped being heavy for a few records. This is still heavy. This is the album that they should have made after Wolverine Blues. If you're going to slow the pace down a little bit, but still have that buzzsaw quality and be heavy and intense and add a little more melody to it, basically, if you want to clean up for the radio and for the rest of the people that aren't listening to your band, this is the album that makes sense. It's not less heavy because it's not as fast. The vocals have the same classic thrash vibe, that mid-paced barking that doesn't go high, doesn't go low. It works. I would have taken this over the rock records, but I'm still intrigued by the rock records. I want to know what decision was made that took the band in that direction, and now we're going back to our older sound, but not necessarily the older pace. Well, is it starting to get hot in here, guys? 2003 Inferno Inferno is a really interesting record because on one hand okay let me rephrase that this is not an interesting record <laughs> uh, but but what I mean is it's interesting in the approach I think the approach was like okay we're gonna go heavier we're gonna be heavy we're gonna be a heavy band again uh, but then what what ends up coming out of it is some kind of weird amalgamation of the band that recorded Same Difference being like, so what does heavy sound like now in 2003? Um, the answer is like Kill Switch Engage, right? But like that, this is not you know uh, that. Um, this is like this is like somebody trying to start up a car that has a bad transmission. They're pushing on the gas as hard as they can, but it's just not really going, you know. And uh, that's that's a bit of an issue. I appreciate that they're returning more to a heavier sound, but they're not returning to a death metal sound, really. Um, the vocals, I feel like, are super weak. The drumming is weak on this record, like extremely, uh, which is very out of character for this band. The vocals are, I'm sorry, the, the guitars are heavy, but they don't have the signature buzzsaw guitar sound. Um, a lot of the stuff that makes them entombed is not on this record uh and that's disappointing so what you get is like what might have been a decent debut record by a different band um is is really just kind of falls flat on its face here and i'm just like i don't really i don't i don't know what i don't really not really sure what the goal was here the sound is definitely there but it's not being presented as effectively it sounds like the band showed up and said this is how we record our albums and the engineer just could not deliver on the same promises. I think the thing that's interesting about this band, you know, because I, honestly, I, I wasn't really a super big fan of this record for a lot of reasons, but I tried to find something positive to say. It's something I don't think we've mentioned at this point. I mean, we've talked about production, but just really how the band has a variety of guitar tones on this throughout their career. And I've been very impressed up until this point with how the band seems to take time to match a production and a sound with the style they're playing in. And I, I know that maybe seems like a really weird thing to, to notice, but 
Like you couldn't have the production that you heard heard on, you know, Left Hand Path. It wouldn't work for Wolverine. It wouldn't work for Wolverine Blues. Just like, thank God, they didn't really do a whole lot of the same shit from Same Difference on anything else. <laughs> I think that's something that's really interesting. Like on this one, like this sort of feels like a band's first record. Like it almost seems like they wanted to go back to their roots literally of like we're kind of broke we don't have a lot of money let's just kind of make something that sounds real raw and raw and visceral you know like with the low end rumble kind of like a retaliation and stuff like that i just i at least give them props for matching how this record sounds to the songs because other than that there's really not for me a whole lot that i am like I can speak good about it just this is another record where i'm like yeah you did something and it's very samey throughout the whole thing um so that's really the only positive i can give it is the fact that it at least matches what i think it sh the tone should have been for this whole record from the start if that makes any sense i agree well i guess we're done with this one i guess yeah <laughs> let's didn't close that book didn't live up to the inferno name <laughs> did not at all uh who wants to tell me about 2007 Serpent Saints, The Ten Amendments. Ugh. Ironically, this record's totally chill for me. Um, it's death metal again. Like, they've, they've jumped back into it. They've jumped back into death metal. They figured out what it is to be entombed again. Um, unfortunately, it's not amazing. Uh, I think that's that's the problem, is it's, it's a little bit, like, too little too late. I mean, if they had put this record out, in, like, in 98, you know... Uh, I'd have been like, holy crap. But at this point, it almost sounds like it sounds dated for 2007. Um, but let's let's take the year out of it and, and try to pretend like it doesn't sound dated. Uh, they have all the correct elements in place. Their music is good. It's got a bigger swing towards death metal. Uh, vocals are more growly, shouty, you know, all the stuff. This is this is barely death and roll as the band ridiculously refers to themselves. Um they're they're barely that but what they're what it's missing is like in compelling songwriting from a band that used to be able to jam out some pretty good ideas um but now that they're back in death metal territory it's almost like it's limiting their creativity in a way Ugh. or they just didn't have anything left in the bag well i think the one thing I'm, i mean the one thing i checked out because i was under the impression that sort of like we did when we got to like Wolverine Blues and stuff like that, or I guess actually it was more uh, the second record where I was like, oh, it just feels like a, you know a whole new band basically took over after one person was left. This was one where I, I found out apparently like a couple of the band dudes like these were their first records. Like I think the bassist and the drummer, it's their first record. Um, but I don't know. I think the thing that's been interesting about this discography is it doesn't. <laughs> I don't feel like the discography makes sense. Like you, like you said, this seems like something that would probably have come after the first two records. Like this would have been the third record. More in line with yeah. that. And I feel like for, you know, where Wolverine Blues was, you know, then you go back and then all of a sudden you're like, all right, so Wolverine Blues. Well, now we have to, sh to ride to shoot straight and speak the truth. And you get same difference. And it's like same difference is like the weird outlier where it doesn't feel like it fits in any of that. And I feel like that's the fucked up thing about their discography is at times... The, what you think would have been the follow-up record is not, and then you get an album like this, and you're like, why the, where the fuck did this come from? This should have been like, almost ten plus years back. Like, what? Why did it take so long to put this record out? And I think that was the hard thing for me is, this just felt so disjointed to where it lands in the discography. Like, I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't get it. I don't understand why it, why it's here, <laughs> and why you exist. Yeah. I I don't know, and it, and it's like that's. That's what the only thing are I kept coming, you? <laughs> yeah, I just kept coming back to that where I was like, I mean, it's not bad, but it's not great. I just, given the last three records, this feels like the weird record in the order. It's like, why, where did this come from? Why is it here now? This should have been albums before this. And I don't know. I And I also don't know if, I don't know if the touring industry kind of slumped after inferno i don't know if like the band was trying to capture more people like dan to come back like i i just don't know i don't know i just don't know i guess that's really all i have i don't know this is a record where i just don't know why how i feel about it i don't know why it is it's not great it's not terrible it just it's honestly it's just it's almost befitting that this is the last record they put out where you're just like i guess there it is 
there it is i mean yeah it's just doesn't really have its own identity i think anymore i think the band exists at this point as a business and it's like well now we gotta put another thing out you know um and you, you can notice you can always notice when a band hits that level where it's like okay well we're gonna clock in today and do these songs instead of them coming from any kind of a real inspiration um and the band did break up shortly after this yeah, um, i'm not surprised but then they actually ended up returning a few years later under the name Entombed AD, uh, and have re- and have since released another three albums that I do not want to comment on tonight. Since they have three albums out, we can absolutely just do an Entombed AD episode and uh, and kind of continue this conversation where it left off. Is this before the band broke up and reformed as Entombed AD? This is before that. Yes. So why is it a different band? I don't know. It's, it's not entirely. Some, it, this is some sort of legal thing. This is some sort of legal thing because there, there'd be no logical explanation beyond that. Somebody that's not in the band anymore owns the trademark of the band is, is what this is. So they thought of the most creative name as possible, which was Entombed AD. They could they could have called themselves like Wolver- the Wolverine Blues Band or, you know, something. Uh, Uprising or Inferno or anything. Yeah, anything, really. Um, but instead they decided to go with like a, like a stupid name. So that's, I mean, well, that, that's pretty much it, logo, man. Guess, like Entombed, I feel like Entombed started off as this big raging fire and now you're just sitting there trying to smack two flint sticks together. <laughs> Final yeah. thoughts on Entombed, John Beatty. Um, honestly, this is better than I expected. I know that probably for a lot of people listening to this who are fans of the death metal aspect of the band or the era of the band, uh, you're probably not going to agree with me in saying that uh, Uprising and Morningstar are probably two of my favorite records uh, out of the whole discography. I would like to see more of that. Um, I understand why people don't like it if you were like Dan and, you know, more of a fan of the first two records. I do think it's interesting to kind of see that this band is able to pull off so many different styles and other than the last record and kind of Inferno, um, that for the most part, by and large, they succeed in everything they attempt to do. It's just a matter of if you like what they're trying to do. Um, So this, for me, is a band where I went into it expecting to hate 99% of what I was going to hear and was pleasantly surprised to find most of it pretty enjoyable. So um, I I think this isn't it. I think you will find, if you are somewhere between Dan and I, there's something here for you. Um, and I think that's that's my final thought on this, is that there is going to be something here for you if you're just a general fan of rock and or metal. Damn, what about you? I think Entombed is a very influential band in establishing kind of a, a newer type of sound, a more a more um, a more finessed take on American death metal. Uh, I think that they're very pioneering. They are one of the most popular Swedish bands because of metal bands, especially just because of the doors that they opened up for other bands but i don't necessarily think that the discography delivers on the promise of that of those influential records i think the band is good but i think that their output kind of puts them firmly in not great territory um which sounds like a negative thing but really it's not i mean i think that they've been solid but i think that they should have instead of jumping around as much as they did maybe should have just got something and stuck with it and just died on that hill and if that sound was Wolverine Blues, die on that hill. If that if that sound was, uh, you know, if that if that sound is is anything, even if that sound is same difference, but you guys believe in it and that's what you want to do, then stick with it. I think there was way too much of we're doing a new and original thing. Oh, you guys didn't like that? Well, I mean, we can go back to doing the other thing. It's cool. Oh, we want to try something different now. Oh, okay. Well, you know what? It'll be different, but we'll still do some of the stuff. I like listening to Entombed. I don't hate any of these albums. But the band's influence on me as a musician and as a fan changes depending on the day. The albums that sound like death metal are very solid. The ones that sound like fake Foo Fighters are interesting and fun to listen to, but are they as definitive? Are they as influential? Or is it really that complicated? I don't know the answer to that. What I know is when I'm listening to the band... I like what I'm hearing, and I'm okay with the strange choices that they make along the way. 
So I like Entombed. I think Dan likes Entombed when they're heavy. And John likes Entombed when they're hard rock. So in a way, this band might be for everyone. You should be listening to Entombed and make the decision for yourself. Dan, what's your album of the week? My album of the week is The Dead Next Door by Spitfire. We all love Spitfire. We've talked about Spitfire on the show. I don't have to say anything else. It's awesome. John, what about you? I don't know if anyone caught that uh, Vice documentary, like little 30-minute documentary on uh, Papa Roach's Infest, uh, them doing Last Resort. Started off as a piano line, actually. It was really fucking cool. Um, so I've been jamming Infest quite a bit this past week. Solid record. Some fucking Lots of riffs. good record, dude. They've got some good songs over the years, but none of their albums really hold up as well as that mm, one does, in my opinion. Surprised. You might be surprised. This is the same band that rhymed the word eyes with eyes three times in a row. Well, I mean, look at what rap does, rhyming the N-word three different times. She loves me not. For me, it's Miles Davis, kind of blue, because no, it's a new loose. year, and that's I'm going to be loose. listening to more jazz. You're welcome. Take us out, DFT. If you've ever been listening to this podcast and you've thought to yourself, why don't you guys talk about some different bands? Well, we don't know what different bands you're talking about. So if you could please send us an email at show at gmail.com or you can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash discography discussion. You can tweet at us at Discuss Metal. You can tweet at me personally at Discuss Metal Dan. Uh, you can follow us on Twitch at t- twitch.discussmetal.com. If you want to represent discography discussion out on the street in the real world, we have a Teespring store with our name slathered all over all kinds of sweet merchandise. There will be a link in the show notes that will take you right to that store. There will also be a link in the show notes to our Discord server, which is a live chat service that you've probably already heard of but did not know that we were on. If you follow that link, it will invite you to our Twitch server where you can talk to other fans of the show as well as us on occasion. So check it out. Thank you guys so much, and we'll see you next week. And on that note, this has been episode 205 of Discography Discussion. Thank you for listening. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Subscribe to our podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts, including Google Play, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. Visit DiscussMetal.com for all things discography discussion. And please send questions and comments to Dan and Joe Show at gmail.com. If you are not a patron, you can become one at patreon.com forward slash discuss metal. We have some sweet perks. Hey, Joe, can I have some money? One dollar a month gets you into that exclusive album review feed. Right.